Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining me today. And the topic of our webinar is how to facilitate effective and inclusive virtual meetings. And I will be sharing some strategies for boosting engagement and productivity, tips how to make your meetings more productive and inclusive. My name is Katrina Stoops, and I'm the director for teaching and learning, and also I'm an instructional designer. So let's get started. I prepared just a quick agenda so you will know what I, I will be sharing today and what kind of engagement I plan for all of us for this session. So in this webinar, uh, we will explore how to boost participant engagement by incorporating two strategies. So we'll explore two strategies, flip meetings and small group discussions. And this uh, th these two strategies can truly transform your meetings. How do I know? Well, I will share in a minute. I will share the why behind the strategies in a minute. So also we will talk about some planning, just general planning tips to maximize productivity and avoid Zoom uh, burnout among participants. And at the end of this um, webinar, I uh, would like us to actually uh, do an engaging activity. I planned uh, a small group discussion and we will be using breakout rooms to have a fun discussion among, among ourselves. And I prepared a really great topic for that, for that discussion for all of us. So that is a brief agenda. And let's get started. This year has been, actually more than a year now, has been truly unprecedented. We switched all our operations online. We're still predominantly online. Uh, pretty much all of us still conduct virtual meetings. And um, we schedule meetings to share some things with our colleagues to brainstorm ideas, to engage in a committee work. We are on Zoom or any other video conferencing platform. I'll just use Zoom as a collective word for any video conferencing platform. So we are on Zoom a lot. And depending on our role, we can have two, three, maybe even more virtual meetings daily. And of course, when you have so many virtual meetings every single day, it does contribute to this uh, Zoom fatigue uh, phenomenon that we all are familiar with right now. Then since we can't really avoid meetings, I mean, uh, we can, but sometimes we can't. So it really does depend. Um, but we all want to make our meetings more productive and, and engaging. That's the goal we all share. So as a, a meeting facilitator, for example, the one who organizes meetings, of course, I would uh, want to make my meetings engaging, productive, and inclusive. And also as an attendee, I uh, attend a lot of meetings myself on a daily basis. And of course, every time I look for that engagement component, and um, sometimes I find it, sometimes I don't. Before I start sharing the strategies that can make your meetings more productive, more engaging, and more inclusive, I wanted to show you this image that I found on Google. And to me, represents this Zoom fatigue uh, condition or situation that, you know, we all keep talking about. If you really closely pay attention to the body language, at least it's in my opinion, I look at the faces of this four people who are participating in a training or in a meeting, I'm not sure, or maybe it's a class, um, online class, virtual class, I can kind of tell that they're not really engaged. Uh, they're kind of distant. Maybe they're looking away. They um, are tired a little bit. So they're not really focused and they're not engaged. So at least this is how I, looking at their facial expressions and body language, this is how I interpret their, uh, their body language, because this is how we know if somebody is engaged or not just by looking at their body language. We definitely don't want that to have that uh, during our meeting. I always hope that this is not the case when I facilitate my presentations, my webinars, my training, or my meetings. So I just hope that this is not how people feel. We all agree that we don't want our attendees 
participants to feel like this. But what can you do to address these issues, to address these challenges of you know, people being disengaged and um, tired and just not focused and not alert? Well, there are strategies that we can uh, adopt to make our meetings more effective, more engaging, and more inclusive. What I did, I divided up the strategies into two parts. This slide is all about traditional strategies. And the rest of the presentation will, uh, so I titled those strategies going beyond traditional strategies. Let's focus, before we uh, start talking about those higher level strategies, let's talk about this traditional strategies. And the, the reason why I call them traditional, it could be called foundational uh, strategies, doesn't really matter. But what matters is that this is the bare minimum that everyone should be doing when organizing and then facilitating their meetings. This is just the bare minimum. And I know that many of us already do that. So I see that when I participate in meeting. Most most of us do a really good job. Just a quick with those strategies, but just a quick reminder that this this is important. One of the first uh, strategies that is so easy to adopt, but they can make a very big difference is sending out an agenda ahead of time. We all know that participant engagement greatly improves if everyone knows what is expected of them. What, uh, what to expect from the meeting. Th th this is very important. And I know most of us, pretty much all of us do that already. The second strategy is not black and white. There is, <laughs> we can have a discussion about that. The strategy is um, basically when you facilitate a virtual meeting, you can ask your participants to turn on their camera. Turning on your cameras will allow you to see your participants' uh, facial expressions, their body language. And so we can see that. And it's so, so important for us to be able to see that this is how uh, it's called nonverbal communication. And it is really, really important for all of us. So it does improve collaboration. But I, I agree uh, with some arguments against uh, turning on uh, your camera. So when would uh, turning on your camera not really work or when it would not contribute to engagement or collaboration? I think, again, and just my personal opinion, I think that it wouldn't matter if you have your camera on or off if you have really, really large meetings. I definitely attended meetings and workshops and webinars where there's so many people, 40 people, for example, uh, even if uh, you have your cameras on, it's just not humanly possible to kind of see everyone. But when would um, turn the fact that you turned your camera on matter? Well, I think it matters when you are in a smaller meeting, like 10 uh, people or fewer, then it really does matter because it's kind of a smaller group and usually it's probably going to be some kind of work, a discussion among the participants. Maybe it's a design group. Maybe it's a committee where you have a discussion on the topic or brainstorm ideas or work on a document, a policy, something together. And in this, uh, in these type types of situations, having your camera on is going to be very, very important. This is what I do when I attend smaller meetings. Uh, I always try to keep my camera on. In a large meeting setting, it depends. Sometimes I would just keep it off because I just feel kind of it doesn't really make sense. But sometimes I would keep it on. So just wanted to talk a little bit about, a little bit about why having your camera on is important when it really makes sense to do that and how so the psychology behind it. Well, another great uh, suggestion is giving your attendees an opportunity to contribute and get involved. Even a simple thing like asking a question and asking uh, your participants to type answers in the chat, or maybe you can do, uh, you know, you can use a poll and just put a question on the poll and just let your participants vote or something. Like even a small little activity like that could make a huge uh, difference. And we are going to talk about other activities, other types of interactions that you can bring in a minute. The second part of this presentation is going to be all about strategies for uh, keeping uh, everyone who attend your meeting really, truly engaged. And the last strategy is 
um, a question that I always ask myself when scheduling, organizing my meetings. Do we need to have a meeting in the first place? <laughs> Many workplaces have a meeting culture and is really challenges, challenging. If you have multiple meetings scheduled every single day, it just when are you going to do your work? It really does add up. Asking this question, do you need to have a meeting in the first place is, I think, very, very important. If the goal of your meeting is to share information, to share some updates where participation is not really going to be a requirement, collaboration or participation, then maybe you don't need to have a meeting. Maybe you can just send out an email sharing those updates. Maybe you can record a video uh, sharing the same updates or do a audio podcast. Or if you do need to have a meeting, sometimes, you know, it's important to have meetings, maybe not do that as often, instead of having such meeting once a week, do it once a month. So just maybe reduce the frequency of such meetings. These are the traditional tips that can make a huge difference. But I'm going to go beyond this traditional strategies now and talk about some approaches that can really improve your meeting quality and truly make your meetings more inclusive. So we're going to focus on how to make meetings more inclusive and how to bring your meetings to the next level. Two strategies I'm going to uh, discuss today is flipped meetings and small group discussions. And just a reminder, at the end of this session, we are going to have a small group discussion. So stay tuned. It's going to be super fun. I prepared a good question for, for that small group discussion activity. Flipped meetings. Let's talk about flipped meetings. What is flipped meetings? Why is the psychology behind it? And I'll share an example with you as well. Flipped, uh, the term flipped classroom or flipped learning. That is the term that comes from instruction. Flipped learning, flipped classroom. This approach has been uh, around in education for a long time. I remember I did my first presentation on how to flip a class, flip classroom 10 years ago. And even then that approach was already super popular. Now I noticed the term flipped migrated into leadership development and organizational development. Now there is this term flipped meetings. And I think it's wonderful. So many, many people flip their meetings now. What is flipped meetings? The flipped meeting approach is very simple. Share the informational presentation before the meeting so that participants are fully informed up at front. And then Use your meeting time on discussions, on um, maybe Q&A, on soliciting feedback, doing the work. In a traditional setting, what happens is usually the discussion or sharing updates, kind of this passive work, passive uh, situation when people just sit and stare at the screen. That part happens during the meeting. And then um, usually... Uh, not always, but usually you have to do some kind of homework. And if it's a recurring meeting, for example, if it's a design group, a task force, so you, you end up with some kind of homework that you need to do in between the meetings and then the next meeting, do the same thing. I, I don't mind homework. I'm not against homework. But the problem is if you are a member of several uh, groups like this, then it really adds up. So you end up doing a lot of work in between the meetings. And then in addition to that, you attend those meetings. Plus, of course, you have to do your work that, you know, for your role. So it really does put so much pressure on all of us. And we all complain. We may not be complaining out loud, but we all feel unhappy about this situation. Maybe not all, but many of us. So when you flip your meeting, opposite happens. You do all the work during the meeting and then your meeting time is spent on uh, something that is very very productive so that homework is happening during the meeting so you're more engaged you're more productive and uh, people don't have to do any work after the meeting. That's the ideal uh, scenario. Of course, when you have those recurrent meetings, if you're like meeting with, with your group often, then not every meeting can be flipped like this. If you 
try to aim for this flipped approach as frequently as possible, then it will reduce the cognitive overload and the workload for everyone who is who joined your, your group task force or design group and yeah, other work, any other group. So here's an example. I was fortunate to experience this flipped meeting approach as a participant. And I just wanted to share this example of how our project lead did that because I just thought it was brilliant. This is what this was my first time experiencing flipped meeting approach ever. So I've done flipped classrooms. I've facilitated flipped classrooms, but paid, I had never participated in a flipped meeting until, until this one. So the project lead did it so well. And I want to give this example, kind of show how she, uh, the project lead uh, structured the, the meetings. So we had the recurring meetings happening every other week. And uh, not every meeting was flipped, but one of the first meeting was flipped and it was really great. Prior to that meeting, our project lead sent us an email with detailed instructions that outlined what each group was expected to do. So we were working in groups, small groups. And then when we came, when we met on Zoom, we already knew what was expected of us and we just went straight to work. We had, each group had uh, our own breakout room and we worked in our breakout rooms for about an hour. And uh, I can only speak for my group. We completed at 60, just in one hour, we completed 60% of the project. Our meeting time was not spent on discussions and sharing updates. Our meeting time was spent on getting the project done. That was uh, one of our first meetings. Of course, not every single meeting was flipped like this, but we I noticed that it, there was a lot of uh, flipped going on. And uh, so that I noticed that our project lead tried to flip uh, meetings as frequently as possible. And it was just so productive. It was so engaging. And uh, I, just, I really, I just fell in love with this approach. And that's the reason why I decided to do this presentation because I had such a great experience. And now I'm a huge advocate of flipped meetings and I just wanted to spread the word and share this example with everyone who is interested. When would flipped meetings work? Because uh, this flipped meeting approach wouldn't work all the time. There's time and place for flip meetings. Flip meetings would work, uh, this approach would work very well for design groups, task forces, basically any uh, type of situation where you're meeting, in, you're working as a smaller group, 10 people maybe, um, under 10 people. And when you're working on solving a problem, uh, developing a document, writing a policy, anything that you're doing together that is like you're creating some kind of tangible product result in those meetings smaller. So that's when this flipped meeting approach would work so, so well. Now, large meetings. So we talked about smaller meetings where you meet with people to get the, you know, your work done. It's a smaller group setting, but we also attend large meetings all the time. And I want to focus on some strategies, how to make large meetings more engaging and most importantly, more inclusive. So let's talk about large meetings now. So here's a scenario that is so, so common in a large meeting setting. You have, I don't know, 20 plus people, sometimes 30, 40 people, uh, and many of them have their cameras off. You don't even see them. And uh, there's usually some sort of Q&A session and a meeting facilitator asks a question and um, there is this awkward silence for a few seconds. And then maybe, a few very long seconds later, a couple of people start like sharing the ideas. So they chime in and they start the discussion and you just feel so relieved that at least someone, someone jumped in and started the conversation. But even if you have someone who jumps in and starts the conversation and you know, a few more people join along the way, if you have, I don't know, 30 people and only five of them are actually participating. That's because that's what usually ends up happening. I usually 
I try to pay attention to this dynamic uh, dynamics um, every time I have large meetings and I'm kind of like who is uh, who's sharing and who is not. And it's always a small percentage of people. A small percentage um, of people uh, actually feel uh, brave enough to uh, give the ideas, share the suggestions and so on and so forth. And if the goal of that Q&A is truly to solicit feedback, to hear everybody's perspectives, then you're not, you're not hearing from a majority of, uh, of the folks who are in your meeting. This is not inclusive. We want our meetings to be inclusive, right? And also the situation when you ask a question and there's just you know this awkward silence and maybe just a few people participating, it's very painful for a uh, for facilitator. I've definitely been in situations like this. But what is important to understand is there is a reason why people feel, why people don't volunteer to actually speak up in front of a large group. Well, based on the decade, decades of research, we know that people feel much more comfortable sharing ideas, speaking out in small groups rather than in large groups. In teaching and learning, this phenomenon is well documented and educators, we don't use large group discussions or rarely we use large group discussions. We use small group discussions. People just simply don't feel comfortable speaking in front of large groups. And especially if they don't know each other very well, that's even worse. So what would you do if you need everybody's uh, feedback and everybody's input, right? Well. You can set up a small group discussions to solicit feedback and to hear everybody's perspectives. Because what, so what is the reason why you're doing a Q&A, for example? The reason why most of us decide to do Q&As is to solicit everybody's feedback. And if only a small percentage of people feel uh, brave enough to provide their ideas and share the suggestions, provide the suggestions and share the ideas, then you don't hear from a lot of people who are also participating. When you set up small groups, it addresses this challenge. You can use breakout rooms to set up random groups and then maybe five, uh, depending on how many people you have, maybe five to six people per group or four to five and post a question that you would want people to discuss in small groups. Also, Another idea could be to give groups a shared document, like a Google Doc, and ask everyone, while they're having that discussion in small groups, they can document the ideas, everything that they're discussing in that document. And then you would, you know, you would give everyone enough time to actually have that discussion. And then you would bring back, uh, you would bring everyone back to the main room. And what happens usually after having a small group discussion is kind of a warm up. People feel much more comfortable now sharing ideas in front of a large, uh, a large group. And also you could, what you could ask, you could do, you could ask uh, one representative from each group to share what their groups discussed, or you could just use the document and uh, all the ideas are there that, you know, everyone had an opportunity to uh, provide their feedback. So if the goal of the Q&A is to solicit every everybody's feedback here from everyone, then this is a really great way to hear everybody's voices and to make meetings more inclusive. Yes, it will take more time because you're doing this small group setup, but if you care about everybody's opinions, that's really the way to do it. And as I promised, we're going to have a small group discussion in a minute. So I have two more slides for you that I just wanted to go over and then we'll have this fun and engaging activity. Just some general tips or things to consider as we are organizing our meetings, just general best practices. Step number one, setting clear objectives and outcomes for your meetings. Basically, as you are putting together, scheduling your meeting, organizing your meeting, preparing for your meeting, it's important to ask, what is the goal? What is it that I want to achieve during the meeting? Am I going to do, a, um, is engagement like open discussion among participants, um, is, is that important for the meeting? And then based on that, uh, you would plan activities 
for your meeting. Maybe you would decide to flip your meeting, or maybe you would decide to smaller uh, do a small group discussion, or maybe you would decide that you don't have a don't have to have a meeting. Maybe you could just share those updates and things you want to uh, share with everyone via an email. And then the third step is facilitation. And I feel like I can do a whole separate webinar on how to facilitate inclusive meetings. But uh, one thing I kind of wanted to mention here is at the, at the end of the meeting, it is important to have a clear call to action. And of course, that call uh, to action would be connected to the goal of your meeting, why you, uh, you asked everyone to come. Examples could be maybe you would discuss roles and responsibilities. Uh, if you're working on some project, maybe you could assign some roles, discuss a project deadline. Maybe you would have a discussion about other meetings, doing how and when to uh, a schedule other meetings to continue the discussion. So again, kind of depends on the, on the goal of your meeting, but having a clear call to action. What is it that you want people to do or to think about, to consider as they are leaving, leaving your meeting? And now it's a time for discussion. As I kept saying, we're going to have a small group discussion now. And for the question, so I'll just do, uh, I'll set up breakout rooms and I'll give you approximately, I don't know, seven minutes to share your ideas. But in small groups, the question is really kind of open-ended. Any strategies from this presentation uh, that perhaps resonated with you and you want to implement them in your uh, meeting planning or meeting facilitation, or maybe some other strategies that you'd use and they work so well and you want to share with your group members. Strategies that uh, from this presentation or for, from uh, your own experience, your own practice, so just share with your group members. You will have approximately seven minutes and then I'll bring you back to the main room and we'll have a debrief. So if some, somebody from your group could share out what your group members discussed, that would be uh, wonderful.